Uh, welcome to this conference. And thank you, Christine, for setting the scene. Um, I feel really privileged and humbled to be standing here to share with you and to look back on what we have achieved together in the last eight to 10 years. Um, but when I try to recollect the starting point of this journey, at least for myself, I think probably this is the reason when you look into the harbor with the ships, belging out all these plumes, making very annoying scenes, um, or perhaps the bunker fuel that they are burning, which is very thick and viscous and smelly, uh, with high silver content and trace metal. Then thinking about the health impact, these um, fuel uh, after they are burned with the pollutants coming out on human health. And this picture actually uh, is taken from Professor James Corbett's research on the PM 2.5 pollution and its health impact around the world back in, I think, 2007, which is a pioneering research at that time. And lastly, thinking about our own city, the morphology and how close we are living and working close to the container terminal areas where we will be directly affected by the pollution and of course the noise and the light pollution as well. Now um, with all these uh, facts and observations we started our journey of en inquiry. We look around the world as Christine mentioned we turned to LA and Long Beach uh, because they've been doing a lot of good research and they are coming up with lo a lot of good practices in industry and voluntary program as well. And we started our first you know, uh, piece of research um, with two interns. And then we embark on an engagement process uh, back in 2008, uh, which we call the Green Harbor uh, Program. Now, in those uh, engagement and meetings, I think there are two key areas that we've been sharing with the uh, industry stakeholders. One is best practices around the world, so mostly examples, uh, regulations, and also you know, ways to reduce emissions coming from ships and port operation uh, in California, mainly, uh, in Long Beach and LA. But secondly, and also very importantly, we discuss a lot on what's happening around the world under the International Maritime Organization's regulatory framework because for the industry, this is the way to go. They don't want to have different regulations or standards. They want to follow the IMO's standard and direction. And so we had a lot of discussion at that time with the industry players about you know, what we can do with this regulatory fr framework in Hong Kong. Um, you know, we know that at that time, back in 2008 to 2010, when we had the discussion, we were talking about um, uh, a sulfur cap, a global sulfur cap for the bunker fuel, which is at 4.5%, which is very high. And that was, you know, further reduced to 3.5 in 2012. And at that time, we already have the emission control area concept with the IMO. But then we only had uh, North Sea and Baltic Sea as the two seeker sulfur emission control area at that time. And they are using 1% sulfur fuel, which was then further reduced uh, in January this year to 0.1% sulfur. Okay, so that's the scene at that time that we know. Um, for civic exchange, we believe that engagement is really important because we know that we can't do it on our own. We can only achieve anything if the industry is also on board. So we started the engagement process. We organized different meetings. Basically, we want to engage the relevant stakeholders honestly and directly. Uh, we want to discuss um, regulatory changes, but we also know that we have to be inclusive in those meetings. So we invited people coming from different but related sectors working on shipping and port uh, operations to join us in those discussion. Um, because we believe that with the stakeholders, at the end of the day, we can then influence policy change. And Christine mentioned very rightly that throughout the whole process, we really agree that partnership and transparency is important. We have to think long term rather than short term. So we set our target at the very, very beginning. We really want to have 
regulation rather than just voluntary action. We really want to work together with the region rather than just focusing on Hong Kong. So these are the long-term goals that we had when we uh, had our first discussion, had our first meeting. And throughout the following meetings and engagement, we keep on reiterating the importance of focusing on these very important issues. And um, last but not least, of course, in those meetings, it's also a platform for us to share information. What's happening in Europe or in America in terms of new regulation? What are the timetable? What can we learn from uh, you know, those examples? Uh, what's the latest scientific uh, findings related to ship emissions and port emission. Um, can we replicate the methodology, say, in Hong Kong, in, uh, in, in China? Uh, are there any takeaway from those research? These are the topics that we talk a lot as well in those process because we know in order to move forward, uh, we cannot just rely on commitment. We also have to have the knowledge and the understanding about what's happening around the world. So um, we've um, been talking to you know a whole lot of people many of you are in the room and i have to say thank you so much for being with us uh, in the last eight to ten years um and you know in terms of numbers um these are you know i, I can come up with the real numbers because i'm losing counts of how many meetings we had over the last 10 years but definitely we have one major conference on ship emission this is the second one so this is shipping dialogue too okay we had the last one shipping dialogue uh in 2011. Uh, we have at least 10, I think closer to 20, cross-sector workshops uh, in the last five years. We have hundreds, really hundreds of meetings in Hong Kong and also in China to discuss, to talk, to just to give briefings about what we've been doing and want to share the good news, share the excitement, and try to bring people on board so then we can work together. Um, so this is really hard work, but I think it's worthwhile. Now, I recall uh, in 2010 there was a meeting uh, it should be in July. That's a very uh, important, important meeting because in that meeting we were beginning to discuss what we can do as a group in Hong Kong to try to do something, maybe on a voluntary basis. But then I remember in that meeting, you know, there, there's a gentleman asking, you know, uh, Simon, why do you think that ship is the main contributor? because we have power plants, we have vehicles, uh, of course we have ships, but you know, why, why you think it's ships and why should we be responsible? Then I show him the report. At that time the report was not published, but we already had some preliminary results. So this is the emission inventory for Hong Kong that was done uh, starting I think in 2008 for four years and we completed and published it in 2012. This is very comprehensive, and we use a new approach to do the infantry with the activity-based approach. We use AIS data for those who are in the industry, you should know the automatic identification system information, which track a vessel's movement and speed and the location so that we can very accurately uh, estimate emissions from the ships and where the emissions are being produced. Um, so these are all very in useful information. So I show them these tables. And with the tables, number one, we know that container ships is a major contributor to ship emissions, followed by cruise ships, dry bulk carrier, general cargo vessels, and oil tanker. Together, they contributed 98% of the emission of three major pollutants in Hong Kong, including sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, and also particulate matters. So this is very clear, okay? We have to work with the container industry and also the cruise industry and so on and so forth to make changes. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we know that a lot of emission has been produced when the vessels are at birth. Um, for SO2, it's up to 40%. For NOx and PM10, it's roughly 35%. And it kind of made up my mind at least that we should target the birthing location. If we want to do something simple, the lowest hanging fruit, we should go after the birthing location. So that's the second point. The third thing, when you look at this emission map, you can quickly tell the emission hotspots in red. And the biggest red dot here is Kuai Chung container terminal areas with other you know, scattered red dots as well. So basically, with the evidence, we need to work with the container industry first 
we need to work with them in terms of what can be done to reduce emission at birth with the container ships, and then focusing with Kwai Chung. Now then, of course, with the evidence and then with further discussion in 2010, in July, I think in two months' time, we've got some champions you know, standing up saying, OK, now we should do it because the evidence is clear. And we already have the experience in the US and Europe to switch fuel. So should we focus on fuel switching and try to do it voluntarily, maybe for a couple of years? And of course, you know, uh, within the Hong Kong Line and Shipping Associations and the Hong Kong Ship Owners Association, they have their own internal meetings. They discuss and discuss. And we also have discussion with them back and forth. And finally, I think in October, we come up with the Fairwind Charter in 2010. Uh, that's announced in October 2010, uh, effective starting from 2011. Now, Christine, thank you for reminding me to remind you all about the details because this is really important. Now, I think uh, the wordings are not legible, but I can read from where I am here. Uh, apart from agreeing to switch to 0.5% sulfur fuel um, between 1st of January 2011 until uh, December 31st, 2012, which is two years, uh, they want to collaborate within the sector and with the Hong Kong SAR and Guangdong governments to introduce regulation on ship emissions, which is consistent with international standards. Okay, so there are so many key words here. Regulation, consistency with international standard, and they want to work with Hong Kong and Guangdong government. Okay, and at the bottom, you know, actually they rally uh, the other related sectors as well. So they want to work with the container terminals, they want to work with the ocean-going passenger liners and other maritime users of the port. They want to work with and encourage the cargo producers and buyers to also be part of this process. And they welcome the support of customers. Uh, I've invited some you know, uh, shippers here today. So they are also involved. They are also part of you know, the, the, the bigger sector. And um, with the Fairwind Charter, actually, the container trade, they wanted right from the start to work with everyone. So I think this is really, really important and very impressive. And you know, for that, I really want to applaud them for their vision uh, for collaboration and partnership. Now, as you know, um, the first Fairwind Charter was for two years. But then in 2013 and 2014, uh, the associations, they agreed to extend the charter for you know, two years until the end of 2014, bearing in mind that you know, they feel the regulation will be in place in 2015. So that's their plan. Now, um, I think I, I already covered these, um, the key messages from the industry. They really wanted to be part of the solution. I think that's very clear in day one. And they think voluntary action, they can use it as a starting point, but they want regulation because that's the best and most effective way to clean up. Um, they want consistency with international maritime organizations, regulation. I think it makes a lot of sense. And I think at the end of the day, they really want to see a level playing field within the sector and also across the region. So it's not just within the sector in Hong Kong that everyone has to comply. It's about compliance across the whole region, in Hong Kong, in Shenzhen, Yantian, Shekou, whichever port you are talking about, they want the same regulation because that's what they call a level playing field. Okay, they don't want unnecessary port rivalry in this region. Now, I think these are history and these are things that you are so familiar with. With the Fairwinds Charter, of course, the government, they've come up with the incentive scheme in 2012 and then policy address 2013, the government announced that you know, they are going to look into uh, new regulation for at birth fuel switching. Um, also in 2013, in March, the government published the new clean air plan and there's a chapter dedicated to ship emissions. Um, and in that chapter, actually the government also mentioned that setting up a PRD emission control area will be their ultimate goal for emission control in this region. And 2014 policy address, the government 
reiterated their intention to legislate, and there are uh, new measures to try to uh, further reduce marine emissions. Um, of course, you know, in a few days' time, we will have the new regulation. Now, other than the Fairwinds Charter and the commitment and the partnership, I think we also want to see real results, right? You know, even with uh, a very exciting partnership, if it doesn't deliver, then it makes no sense to, to have such a partnership. So if you look at the numbers, um, and I have the privilege to work with EPD on a number of times to try and calculate and estimate the emission reduction. And from the numbers that I have, we know that between 2011 to 2013, roughly every year, there are about 3,000 ocean-going vessel cores switching to low sulfur fuel. Now, I think we are talking about 30,000 cores a year. Okay, so it's about 10% of the course uh, has been, you know, uh, following the Fairwinds Charter and they, uh, they committed to switch fuel. And in terms of emission reduction, we are talking about 800 tons roughly each year of sulfur dioxide and 70 tons of PM also roughly every year. Now, if I use 2013, the emission, total emission of SO2 and PM as a reference, we are talking about maybe roughly a 5% reduction of SO2 and a 3% reduction of PM10 across the territory just because of the Fairwinds Charter, just because of the field switching under Fairwinds Charter. This is very impressive. For those who are working in air quality control, you know to get a reduction of a certain pollutant by a few percent actually is quite difficult. It's not easy to achieve. So this is quite an achievement. Now, of course, um, Fairwinds Charter has been recognized internationally. So these are some of the journal articles. Uh, even uh, there's a publication by the International Maritime Organization using Fairwinds Charter and as a good example, as a best practice um, to showcase, to share with their audience around the world. Now, um, in, in the article to the further right, um, Fairwinds Charter as the model for public, private, and NGO partnership. I think this is all about Fairwinds Charter. It's about the government, the industry, working with NGO together for a goal and try to achieve something. So um, apart from the international uh, recognition, we also have some influence to our neighbor. So Sunjin, they also have the incentive scheme modeling very much on the Fairwinds Charter, you know, encouraging voluntary action with incentive. And then at the end of the day, maybe also looking for regulation. And we have got um, a speaker from Sanjin who are going to tell you more in the afternoon. Now, to summarize, I think these are the ingredients for the success of the Fairwinds Charter. We are talking about a platform for partnership. We need some leaders to champion the whole course. Um, we are transparent and honest and willing to talk. Um, there are scientific evidence to support real action. Um, I talk about voluntary initiatives which will lead to regulation. They are mutual trust and respect, and I can assure that, you know, I become friends to many of you sitting down there because of the Fairwinds Charter and also because of this journey. And I think most important of all, we have common goal and vision, and we know what we want to achieve together. Now, um, looking back, I know I only have two more minutes. Uh, I really want to thank a lot of people. There are representatives from shipping lines here in this room. I really want to thank them. Um, ship liners, uh, Hong Kong Ship Liners Association, Hong Kong Ship Owners Association. Um, they are very instrumental in the Fairwind Charter. I really want to thank them. Um, I see Peter Ng down there. He is probably one of the first people that I met and talked to when we have this initiative. He's retired, but still very much following our work. And without his support, I think we probably wouldn't be getting that far. So thank you, Peter. And there are so many other people. I can't you know, name you and thank you, you know, one by one personally, but thank you very much. We, I also want to thank the government. Um, EPD, we've got a lot of friends and colleagues here from EPD. And also Marine Department, I know there's a friend from Marine Department also in this room. They are very, very important for the whole process. I bother them many, many times for data, for my inventory study, and they know me very well because you know, I always email and call them, chasing them for the data. Uh, for that, thank you so much.
I want to thank my colleagues as well uh, from Civic Exchange. Um, you've been through with us, you know, in a very meaningful journey, and Christine, of course, uh, uh, during the time when you were working with us. Um, and um, now, I think uh, this is a very amazing and rewarding journey. Um, and when I look back this timeline, I'm thinking perhaps at the moment, we should think about the next step. So what I really want to do is to embark on another journey uh, with you, uh, because we are only a few days away from the regulation. So it's good to you know, talk about what we have achieved together. But I think more realistically and more constructively, we should look ahead. And I think it is really important for us to think about what we can achieve together next, which I think would be to set up an emission control area in this region. Now, um, it's taken like 10 years for us to get the regulation, but now let's forget about the regulation. That's almost done, we are there. Think about what's next. This is bigger, this is more challenging, and this is going to bring a lot more benefits to every one of us living and working in this region. Um, I know I need your support, okay? And that's why you are here in the room, because we want to bring you in, we want to listen to you, we want you to understand why we want to push for an ECA, and we want you to become part of the journey. Um, I hope that you can learn a lot from the speakers and also through the discussion today and tomorrow, as much as we can also hear from you about your concerns, your experience, or your insights uh, for having an emission control area in the PRD in the near future. But definitely, we need to work together. With that, thank you so much.